I, I must tell you all that when um, I was moving to, to go from a somewhat academic paper to submit to the symposium, since as an adjunct, I really feel under pressure to appear to be as academic as my academically uh, credentialed colleagues, which I'm not, um, but I do my best. Um, but when I was writing my slides, developing my slides, I have to tell you, I was feeling a tad irreverent. Um, I sometimes suggest that that's because I'm a redhead and redheads kind of have to do that. We just need to stand out from the crowd. We do anyway. Um, I probably have the temperament that goes with that. Um, and so if you're looking for deep seriousness today, I will do my best to intersperse that with uh, a little irreverence. But the topic I'm talking about is really important. And I was really delighted to hear Greg Ballestrero this presentation this morning. Because in many respects, what we're going to talk about next, building a great place to work, busy, building a positive workplace, is really about the people part of sustainability in the way that Greg Ballestrero was talking about it. And so we're going to talk about that. I really like an interactive session. So if you have questions, please pop up. We'll try to keep the pace. Uh, so that we can get questions in the moment, have some questions at the end. Um, any questions, good. Disag disagreement questions are even better. Um, so we'll, get, we'll go ahead and get started. So one of the things, and again, I sympathize tremendously with Greg's comment that he really wants to change the world. And I started, as, as um, Professor Cable said, as a you know, public accountant, indentured servant, working in business. I ultimately worked uh, in nonprofit organizations with CFO at AARP. And I have to say that I came away from all of those experiences. The number of decades shall remain unspecified at the moment. I came away with it. There's got to be a better way to do work. Because it doesn't feel good. You get to Monday morning and it's kind of like, oh dear, do I really have to? There are moments of great inspiration great excitement, great accomplishment, but overall work's kind of a chore. And it doesn't really need to be. And it's not in our best interest as individuals, as project managers, as team members, for it to remain that way. And so what we're going to talk about is how, and I want you to be, be kind to me here, is we're going to talk about happiness at work. Happiness at work. Happiness at work, and here's, here's the bona fides from an academic standpoint. This is really about something called subjective well-being. What that is, it's not that, you know, that yellow smiley face that we see sort of ubiquitously or the commercials that say, if you want happiness, buy Coca-Cola. We're not talking about that kind of happiness, although that's part of it. So pleasure is certainly part of it. But an abiding sense of satisfaction and contentment using your strengths, using your own personal unique portfolio at work and in service of something greater than you, whether it's your family, your community, whatever it happens to be, is really what happiness is all about. And we're going to talk about it. And part of what's promised is we're going to talk about the business case of why this actually matters. So I'm, I'm going to revert in some hopefully small but effective ways to my old CFO kind of thing. So if you feel like you're in a finance briefing, that's OK. OK, so you may think that's crazy talk. And I just, as I said, whoops, I was feeling momentarily crazed. Often when I go out and talk about, you know, people know I'm a CFO. They know I've been on boards. They think I'm a pretty serious person. I can put on my grown-up clothes and do that. And I start talking about happiness at work, and people think she has lost her mind. Does she not understand what work's really about? Now, Einstein had a great quote. Does anybody know what Einstein said about insanity? Yes, ma'am. Doing the same thing over and over and affecting different results. Yeah. So Einstein basically said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. How many of you in organizations that do annual or more frequent employee surveys for engagement or satisfaction or employee viewpoints? How are they working for you? Do you know what the results are? Do you know what to do with them? Are you making any changes that like come back in the next year's results? Some. Are they sticky results? Yeah, sort of, kind of. If the changes are sticky. 
the changes are sticky. And if management supports it and if you have the right resources, et cetera. Well, how about this? What we know is that when we look at all these, all these various ideas, and we have a tremendous number of them. We have employee engagement. We have wellness programs. How many of you are enjoying wellness programs at work? Telework at work. Flexible schedules, compressed <coughs> schedules, employee satisfaction, enhancements to pay for performance. Bonus programs, the, oh, by the way, do more with less and we'll give you all kinds of uh, recognition, not a check, but recognition. So one of the things that, that I would offer is we have lots of really good individual great ideas, and each of them addresses part of the issues that are present in the workforce. Now understand that in the U.S., employee engagement, and how many of you are aware of Gallup? The Gallup organization? Okay. The Gallup organization reports that the majority, more than half of, excuse me, the employees in the U.S. workforce are disengaged from work. That means they came to work, they suited up, they're going to execute their job description, but their hearts aren't in it. They're not going to do discretionary work. They're not emotionally attached to their colleagues, to the work that they're doing nor are they attached to the organization. The reason that matters is Gallup's research tells us that if you are um, engaged as an employee and realize about one in six employees are not engaged at all, they are actively disengaged, which means they are saboteurs in the organization. They're the ones that, if you'll pardon me, are kind of bitching and moaning around the water cooler, virtual or otherwise, and are destructive in the environment. If you don't have engaged employees, or let's put it in the affirmative, if you do have engaged employees, what an organization gets, what your project team gets, and this matters because you can instill possibility for employee engagement at a team level, even if it's not available at the overall organizational level. You have higher productivity. You have um, better creativity. You have less retention losses, so you have people less likely to leave less pre, present, pre, excuse me, presenteeism. You have fewer safety instances. If you happen to be in an industry where physical safety is important, you have less theft. You have greater customer loyalty. You sort of get the trend. So part of what we're saying and we look at positive psychology, which is the study of how do you take normal people, people who are not ill, and optimize. You know, you look at the other side of the curve, the upside of the curve, if you look at employee engagement as one of those tools, it has really clear organizational consequences that matter. So we have all of these great simple ideas. Individually, they don't make a co coherent whole. They do create tremendous complexity. I'm working with a client right now that has a wellness initiative. It's a great wellness initiative. They have an employee engagement measure. They, have, they happen to be a federal client. So they're using the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, so they have metrics coming out of that. They have uh, surveys from customers who are using their particular agency services. They have lots of different initiatives, but not coherence. They have tremendous complexity. The managers are actually getting to the point where they're feeling overload. They don't know which initiative to put their shoulder behind. They're all good. They all have merit, but they're a little bit too many. So, one of the conclusions that we've come to is that simple solutions are not sufficient to deal with complex and dynamic issues. You need, as Greg said, you need something that's comprehensive. And so I want to talk about that. And here's the way I think about it. Is we've developed, it's true in project management, when you look at the history of project management, the trends are that we develop individual tools that are responsive to particular issues. They're really good in and of themselves. They respond to a problem, but they don't respond to the broader problem and they don't integrate, or they may not necessarily integrate. What you get is mind-blowing complexity. At some point, there's just initiative overload, model overload, what do I do next overload. But what we really want is we want to pass through that complexity to what I'm going to call elegant simplicity. And you can't get to that kind of simplicity unless you go through the work to understand how the system's working and why. So here's my proposal, actually, 
a colleague's proposal for elegant simplicity. So this is a dynamic model of happiness at work. Happiness at work. Oh dear. I knew I should have left well enough alone. Now if I could have had it be Pharrell, it would have been perfect, but it wasn't. So if anybody feels that they can channel Pharrell for me, that would be good. Hang on just one second. Oh, you can't see that, so that's even better. Okay. So here's the model. This model comes from work that was done in the, in the UK by an organization called the New Economics Foundation. They're a think, and I love this, they're a think-do tank. And they supported the British government, the equivalent of our federal government, to develop a model for subjective well-being at the nation state level. And here's why. The British government, much like the U.S. government and the countries individually, are experiencing this, this break. Economic capability, economic well-being are continuing to go up at record levels over long periods of time. But people's well-being, for example, in the U.S. depression levels, are increasing at a similar rate. When you would think that if, you were, if your economic well-being is better, your overall well-being is better. They're not finding that link. So the Brits decided, the US is in the process of deciding, they decided that in order to really see how a country was performing, you wanted to look at not only its economic performance, but and also you wanted to look at its performance relative to social well-being. That's great. So the New Economics Foundation with a colleague of mine, Nick Marks, said, well, wait a minute, you could do that at work. They took the same research, really wonderful research, and developed this model, a dynamic model, of happiness at work. Remember, happiness we're going to use as a synonym for this fancy subjective well-being term. And what they found is there are really four domains. And it is dynamic. So your experience of work, we'll start at the top, your experience of work, positive emotions, negative emotions, are you engaged? Do you have moments of absorption at work? Do you have a sense of purpose? interacts with your functioning at work, which is are you motivated in a personally sustainable way, interacts with the organizational system, goals, feedback, do you trust management, do they trust you, is it an environment where you can be your best self, is it an environment where you can speak your opinion, where it's open enough to take on additional opinions, all affect your personal resources, what's your health, are you energetic, are you confident and resilient? Do you have a sense of purpose? And the, the conference is posting, the symposium is posting all the papers, so all this juicy data and more is, is, is in a paper that you'll have access to, so if you're feeling like you can't get all this down fast enough, don't worry about it. So let's take a look at, at a little bit about what this means. So what we found is that each of these, this is based on a, um, a survey tool that comes from the British research on subjective well-being, adapted for the workplace. Let's start with personal resources. One of the things that I like about this particular tool, and this is a screenshot from results for an organization, is it's color-coded and it's traffic lights, so it's pretty intuitively obvious what that means. What, let, let's, let's take a quick look at what those personal resources might be. So one of the personal resources, the bottom right-hand quadrant, actually is whether or not you're confident. Do you have confidence? Are you resilient? Who can tell me what resilience is? Anybody know? Yes, ma'am. Being able to withstand emotional and Yeah, so any, any setback, basically, any adversity. And interestingly, adversity can be a positive event, a promotion while it's a good thing, birth of a child while it's a good thing, getting married while it's a good thing in addition to losing your job, being behind on schedule, all kinds of things like that. So any shift in what you, any major change is potentially adverse. How many of you as project managers need people who can bounce back from that? Because you all don't have much of that adversity stuff in your workplace, right? It's, it's not the, the, the daily food of project managers. Not much. 
So one of the things is that resilience is one accessible. So you can tell, you can do short metrics, and you can figure out whether or not people are resilient or not. And here's the part that's really important, is it's trainable. So you can take someone who's not as resilient as you would like them to be, and you can help them get to that point. People who are resilient perform better on difficult cognitive things. They tend, as a matter of, of practice, because they're resilient and self-confident, that's the other element here, is they are more likely to take on complex challenges and set higher goals. Would any of that be useful to you as a project manager? So something as simple as personal resources, are people resilient and self-confident, has follow through and attachable organizational project, team, and individual outcomes, and it's a trainable capability. Okay? The other thing in personal resources that's important is health and vitality. Let me do a quick survey. How many of you got eight hours sleep last night? Not bad. How many of you had breakfast this morning? Oh, good. How many of you are going to exercise sometime today? Okay. How many of you are keeping in close contact with a relatively broad network of friends? Not too bad. All of those things are things that enhance your general health and vitality. One of the most important is maintaining supportive relationships. One of the things I see in my consulting and coaching practice is often people get so embedded in doing the day-to-day -day work that they are lucky if they get home. They're lucky if when they get home they're actually able to have a conversation with somebody where they're present at worst. And they may, because they're so busy at work and so busy with family obligations, not connect with people who uh, they used to connect with. So one of the questions I like to ask at one of the um, one of my federal clients that shall remain nameless because of what they do for a living, um, they actually don't get out much and they don't see people and their, their support networks are very thin. And so what happens when there's adversity at work or a need for resilience, they don't have that fallback network. Gallup reports that both supportive relationships but a best friend at work is the leading indicator. It's the highest correlated element and when you look at employee engagement, is do you have a best friend at work? Do you have a mentor? Do you have someone who champions you? Do you have someone you can go and talk to in confidence when you're about ready to strangle your boss? You know, do you have someone who's a confidant? So, personal resources. Let's take the next one. Organizational systems are very, are, are interesting as well. Let me show you this slide. These are actual client results. Now these client, or this, this particular data set, the organization is pretty good. The only place they're having some difficulty is in the nature, of, is in social value. And there are two questions here. One is, do you feel that the work you do is important? Does it have social value? Are you doing something that improves the community? Whatever that community happens to be. And second, are you doing good work for your customers? Is the work valuable to your customers? How many of you could answer yes to that second question? The work I do is worthwhile for my